my pleasure to introduce our really amazing panel, um, uh, including uh, Michael Antonio Jones uh, from Memphis Mid-South DSA, uh, who coordinated with uh, DSA chapters across Tennessee uh, on Marquita Bradshaw's campaign for the US Senate. Uh, Alex Burnell from San Antonio DSA, uh, who uh, led a historic campaign uh, uh, with other chapters in Texas uh, for, uh, for paid sick time. Uh, Sumathi Kumar, the co-chair of New York City DSA, uh, a tenant organizer who is uh, in, uh, involved in the fight for the strongest tenant protections in, an, in a generation in New York State. Uh, and Daniel Denver, co-chair of Re Reclaim Rhode Island and a member of Providence DSA. Uh, so please join me uh, in a warm uh, welcome for our uh, phenomenal panelists uh, and welcome to today's uh, event, uh, Take It to the House. Uh, we're so glad that you can join us and um, I'm going to ask each one of um, our amazing panelists uh, to give uh, just a quick overview um, of of the campaign or organizing efforts that you're most involved in at the state level. Uh, what's your demand or what was your uh, demand or goal? And uh, what, what is the role that DSA or your organization has played? Um, so let's uh, start maybe with Michael Antonio and then we can go to uh, Sumathi and then Michael Antonio and then, uh, oh, sorry, let's start with Michael Antonio then we can go to Alex and then Sumathi and then Daniel. Hey y'all, uh, I'm Michael Antonio Jones, uh, pronouns he, him. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Memphis Bid South DSA chapter. Um, so we uh, worked with Marquita Bradshaw's campaign um, for Senate uh, and we actually endorsed her in the primary. And you know, this was a process that we took very seriously as a chapter um, and really involved our membership to make sure that you know, this is an informed decision that the chapter is making to get involved into. Um, and through after two or three rounds of voting, uh, we voted to uh, endorse Marquita um, in the primary. And she was one of three of our candidates that we endorsed. We were three for three in the primaries. Um, but being that it is a federal race, which is a statewide race, um, we, we look to the other DSA chapters, middle Middle Tennessee had already begun the process of endorsement, um, but didn't do that in the primary. And so with the help of Middle Tennessee, uh, we reached out to uh, Chattanooga and Knoxville and Northeast Tennessee uh, to get endorsements from each individual chapter um, so that there was a coalition of DSA chapters um, in unison um, backing a candidate who uh, endorsed, who supported the Green New Deal, um, who was for Medicare for all, um, was an environmental activist uh, who stood up to the DOD and other federal agencies um, that thought that, frankly, black communities uh, were expendable. Um, and so we, you know, we saw in the candidate that, you know, while she was not a DSA member, um, she, uh, her campaign, her platform um, fell fully in line with her values. And she was a candidate who uh, wanted to listen, wanted to learn, wanted to expand her horizons, wanted to make sure that the people who were most affected were the ones that were telling the story about the issues that needed to be dealt with. Um, and she went to all 95, can uh, not all 95 counties uh, in the state. Um, and while she lost, the work that we did as DSH chapters um, brought us closer together um, some of us didn't know that, you know, some of the other chapters existed. Um, and now we're working on uh, things that have much farther reaching consequences to uh, Tennessee uh, as, you know, we turn to look at how the TNDP was completely ineffective uh, in not only that race, but down ballot races that we also endorsed. Um, we had one of the, one of our DSA members ran for a Tennessee house race and lost by 400 votes and received no help from the Tennessee Democratic Party. Um, and so we're looking at how, you know, we can shift uh, priorities and reframe uh, things that need to be done as far as the party level in the state 
we're looking at um, municipal races in 2022, we have a DA's race that's coming up. And so we're having conversations right now as a chapter about um, what does our involvement in that race look like? Because you know, the, the district attorney has awesome powers on a municipal level. Um, and so we can spend the next year where we have no elections to issue canvas um, and begin to frame the narrative around what kind of candidate uh, we want to expect from uh, a DA. Um, and so there's other things that we're looking at on the local level, uh, getting on the ballot. Um, Memphis does, has nonpartisan races. And what this means is that folks can slide through the back door um, and appear to be Democrats. And they're actually like bought, and bought by the developers. Um, and so there, there's a lot of ways to um, close uh, avenues for um, uh, behavior like just like tomfoolery and um, and those those are things that we're working on um, as a chapter to you know be sneaky and don't let you let them see us coming um, and so we're we're excited about the things that are on the horizon uh, for us in Tennessee uh, through the work that we've done um, and we've got a long road to hope but um, we're, we're working to expand power um, and to bring, to pull people in and pull people up uh, as we continue to uh, improve people's material conditions. Hey, Nathan. Um, and so I'm going to pass it to Alex. Awesome. Thank you for that segue, um, Michael Antonio. I definitely am going to use the word tomfoolery because I think that fits to Texas too. Um, my name is uh, Alex Burnell. I'm a member of San Antonio DSA, uh, pronouns are he, him. And I was a part of a statewide effort to see that uh, millions of people in Texas, uh, namely in three cities, uh, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas uh, were covered by an ordinance um, for paid sick at the municipal level. Um, Houston would have been on that list if it wasn't for the pesky strong mayor system. Uh, they're going after it right now. Houston DSA is currently collecting signatures, support them so that they can undo that strong mayor system so that they can join us in some of those municipal level fights. But going back to the, the uh, statewide fight for paid sick, um, essentially, you know, we've got millions of folks that um, are not covered by a policy of any paid sick protection at their workplace. So they are, um, not supported um, by their employers when they're ill. Uh, and so we wanted to mandate this at the city level um, because people were paying uh, for it in terms of their health uh, or they were foregoing the, the money for a rent and three days without working in this state uh, because you're sick, if you don't have that coverage, is the money's worth uh, for you know, a bill. Um, and so we thought it was very unjust that so many people be caught up in that circumstance. And so it emerged from uh, Austin first uh, with Councilman Kassad, uh, Workers' Defense Project, Austin DSA. Uh, they did a pretty robust door knocking campaign uh, to collect enough uh, signatures uh, to show support for that initiative. Uh, those same campaigns were taking off in Dallas and in San Antonio, uh, right near uh, when they were ready to vote in their policy in Austin and in um, San Antonio in, in, in particular, where I was doing a lot of the organizing with the local chapter and a coalition of local organizations that I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, we needed to collect uh, roughly around 79,000 signatures in uh, a rather tight period of time. It was like a three month period of time uh, it's 10% of the eligible voting population is what the charter says. We ended up collecting 144,000, uh, which for context is more than the current mayor of San Antonio won his election by, by quite a bit, about 30,000 more signatures than he got votes. Uh, so uh, all of a sudden we seemed like a powerhouse, which the chambers of commerce, which the courts, uh, which the state reps who we're already drafting preemption bills, all thought we wouldn't be able to do. And so I think one lesson is we caught them on their heels um, because they were accustomed to Texas uh, 
basically living up to its reputation as a, as a place unfriendly to labor politics, unfr unfriendly to, to worker politics. And they, they were seemingly unaware that in the cities, you know, folks are incredibly impoverished, segregation, uh, all those things are factors and that a simple working class message would have resonance with a lot of workers when we talk to them. And what the DSA chapter here did locally is, you know, we uh, condensed the policy, which a basic policy design in our, uh, was one hour for every 30 hours worked uh, with, a, with a maximum of either uh, 64 or 48 hours, depending on the size of the employer. Very modest policy in terms of, uh, you know, how much paid sick time you're ultimately getting for the amount of work that you're doing, still much better than not having it at all. And so we condensed that policy onto small cards, rode on buses, went to workplaces, had one-on-one -on -one conversations with workers all across the city, brought them out to city council meetings at key moments in the campaign, had them carry in boxes of the signatures when we were finished uh, collecting the petition, brought them to the court hearings, brought them to the rallies. Uh, so DSA was really critical in bringing the working class folks to the equation and also bringing like an explicit socialist analysis to a policy that a lot of like progressive and, and you know, more center organizations were also participating in. You know, why is paid sick a socialist policy? Well, it transfers some power that was previously in the boss's hands to the workers' hands. And it fits in this broader framework of health justice where, you know, we also as an organization nationally were fighting for Medicare for all. And so there were some joint canvassing that took place for Medicare for all and paid sick using this framework of health justice. So we connected the local to the national uh, through that framework of health justice. And through this all, we coordinated statewide. We talked with one another about you know, when we needed to mobilize at the state legislature, because uh, we understood that there were preemption efforts. There were at least four bills that wanted to preempt the ability of cities to set this policy at all. Uh, there was some screwball analysis of, of paid sick as a wage, and therefore we can't uh, have paid sick at the city level because uh, Texas cities are preempted uh, from raising the, the minimum wage and because they classified paid sick as a wage rather than a fringe benefit. Uh, they argued that we were in violation of the state constitution. Uh, obviously all uh, class war conservatism nonsense. Uh, we fought back. Uh, they weren't able to get any of the preemption bills through. Uh, this was a case of the, the capitalist class, the conservative class being spread too thin. Uh, they tried to do too much at once. And as a result, we were able to out organize them. Yeah, omnibus bill fuckery is correct. Uh, they, they tried to shove too much in one bill and made it kind of poisonous to more constituencies uh, than just DSA. So as a result, a really big statewide coalition uh, came together to uh, dismantle their opposition efforts. And I'll talk a little bit more about the coalition stuff in questions, but that's kind of a basic campaign overview. Great, thanks, Alex. Let's go to Sumathi. That uh, and then we'll go to Dan. Hi everybody, I'm Sumithi. I am currently the co-chair of New York City DSA. Um, and I'm also a general organizer. I work at Housing Justice for All um, in New York. Um, so I'm gonna talk about um, the rent control campaign of 2019. Um, and just to give some overview about that. Um, so New York State has some of the strongest rent control laws um, in the country. Um, we actually have rent control, um, which is start. Um, but over the last like 30 years, they had been totally um, hollowed out by the real estate lobby um, and landlords. And so um, to the point where real estate is just like the most powerful industry in New York, um, all politicians are sort of bought off by real estate. They give tons of money um, and all of the rent control laws or the rent stabilization laws in New York state were totally filled with loopholes. Um, tenants were just being harassed out of their homes. Um, it's contributing massively to gentrification. Um, and tenants, and it was also only in New York City um, and not anywhere else in, the, in a few counties outside of New York City, um, but not upstate. 
Um, and so tenant groups have been fighting sort of a losing battle for 30 years um, around these really tiny like niche loopholes that existed in the rent laws. Um, they kept losing, um, it was really sad. Um, and then uh, in 2017, um, folks decided to come together and shift the way that we were gonna do things. Um, and DSA was a big part of that coalition. Um, and there were sort of two different, there was a bunch of different shifts, but one was that we wanted to include both upstate and downstate folks. So not just folks in New York City, um, but people in Rochester and Buffalo and Albany and all these other places um, so that not so that they could get rent control too, but also so that upstate other legislators um, who were not from New York City could actually also feel pressure to do stuff um, and feel pressure from their constituencies to actually vote the right way and do the right thing. Um, and then the second thing um, was making it a broad coalition and working with both housing, both home homelessness groups, tenant groups, not just uh, rent stabilized groups, which in New York City is sort of like its own thing, but also people who weren't regulated because there's still a ton of people in New York City um, who don't have any regulations at all. Um, so creating a broad coalition and then um, having a unifying message that wasn't just sort of, here's this niche loophole, please fix it, but a message of universal rent control. Um, and housing as a human right. Um, things that were really broad that a lot of different people could buy into, even if you hadn't been deeply involved in the rent, rent stabilization system for 30 years, you could grasp like, oh, I wanna stay in my home, rent stabilization, universal rent control, I'm, I'm ready. Um, and those things really contributed to creating this mass movement that was statewide. Um, and DSA played this huge role. I mean, first we elected Julia Salazar uh, to the state Senate, which was really helpful <laughs> um, and really shifted power. Even though she was just one person, she ended up ca carrying our, one of our bills. Um, she did a ton of work and she also scared a lot of different elected officials in New York State and suddenly they're like, okay, maybe I should do something about this um, and start paying attention to grassroots groups. Um, and there's about 80 people, I mean, 80 different organizations in Housing Justice for All, which was the coalition that fought for um, the rent control campaign. Um, DSA was one of them, or New York City DSA was one of them. Um, there are upstate chapters and then tons of other groups from like tiny tenant associations um, who are just focusing on maybe their own building or just like their neighborhood to really huge organizations like Make the Road um, and other groups like that. Um, so somehow everyone came together to fight for this thing. Um, and I, DSA led a bunch like different phone banks. They mobilized massively to Albany um, and we were really successful I think, um, in painting a picture of the real estate industry as this, like, this evil thing um, that was harassing tenants um, and really creating an enemy out of them so that decision makers, elected officials had to decide like, what side am I on? Am I on the side of tenants or am I on the side of real estate? And real estate is now poison. <laughs> so maybe I shouldn't be on the side of real estate. Um, and then the other thing that I think we did really well um, is have like a huge outside strategy and really focus on direct action, focus on building a mass space um, and not really trying to like, we lobbied, but um, not focusing as much on the lobbying aspect and like the inside strategy, but really like forcing the issue out into the open, making it a crisis that people had to respond to. Um, and I think the last thing I'll say, and I can say a lot of other things, um, but I think timing was really important. Um, in 2019, the rent law, so before 2019, the New York state rent laws expired every few years, creating this sort of moment of urgency. Um, and so I think that if we had tried to like win this campaign in 2017, 
we would have lost, um, even with the same people and the same strategies. But we had this like window of urgency where the, the rent laws are going to expire in June 2019. There's energy, there's like this crisis, it's coming. Um, and we were able to like capitalize on that. Pardon my language. Um, but we were able to use that um, to our advantage. And I think that's something that um, right now the housing movement in New York is really grappling with again, um, because we're in this moment of crisis. Um, we're sort of using this understanding that state legislatures generally don't act unless there's a crisis. Like they are not like proactive people for the most part. Um, they are only going to respond to a crisis, um, and so we have to either create a crisis, bring the crisis to their doorstep or insert ourselves into the crisis that they're talking about right now. Um, and yeah, those are the things that I would say. Um, we were really successful in 2019. We were fighting for nine bills that would close all of these loopholes. Um, we won eight of them. Um, we did not win good cause eviction, which would guarantee tenant protections to everybody in the state, regardless of like how many buildings they lived in or like, I mean, how many, how many units they, the, of the building they lived in um, or they're just blanket protections. Um, so we didn't win that. And then um, that was a really good way to get four more people elected to the state legislature um, this past summer and they all ran on good cause. Um, which I think was really helpful. So now we're going into 2020 with momentum and now we have five socialists in office and state office who are ready to push for good cause and a lot of other things. Um, so yeah, I'll stop there um, and we can talk more about it in questions. Wow, that is brilliant on how you were able to build off of the one thing you didn't win. Uh, incredible. Um, last but not least, uh, let's go to Dan um, uh, from Reclaim Rhode Island. Hey, thanks, Beth. Um, so I'm sort of the odd person out here in the sense that I am the co-chair of a group called Reclaim Rhode Island, which is not uh, part of DSA though I'd say probably the, the slight majority of our steering committee is made up of DSA members, including myself. Um, we were founded in May, um, coming out of the state's Bernie campaign. We had a really strong state campaign that I'm told by multiple Bernie staffers, they could just be flattering us, that we played a very key role in all the buses we sent up to New Hampshire in Bernie's victory there. We did a lot of, we had uh, big rallies and events um, in Rhode Island and never got the chance to actually uh, canvas here. Our last operation was, was canvassing in Massachusetts just across the border and we achieved our mission of defeating Elizabeth Warren but did not anticipate that we might lose Massachusetts to Joe Biden, but so goes things in 2020. Um, but uh, uh, some of you may have uh, uh, read a, a, a piece that I wrote in, in Jacobin around when Bernie dropped out arguing that the Bernie campaign should really uh, work to help maintain local organizing infrastructure that had had popped up both intentionally and organically, like the case in Rhode Island around his campaign. The campaign by and large failed <clears throat> and Bernie, by, uh, you know, who I still love, failed to do that for sure. Um, but we did it anyways in, in Rhode Island. And after a few weeks of, of chaos uh, in the early days of the pandemic, we got back together, you know, for interminable Zoom meetings and, and had a launch uh, convention kind of event in, in May. Um, and we decided that our first, uh, that we would have basically have three prongs of the organization. One, an issue campaign prong, um, not that we won't work on more than one issue at once, but like overwhelmingly focus on one issue at a time. And right now that's the state budget um, because coronavirus here everywhere blew a massive hole in the state budget. And our governor, Raimondo, who was a Bloomberg endorser and, um, you know, I think kind of like an out is like an outside chance for uh, like Biden treasury. I think very, it gets talked up in Rhode Island. I don't think it's likely, but she's like a very neoliberal Democrat. And she was promising, you know, like this is gonna be a brutal budget. And we were like, no, actually the budget should be balanced uh, with, uh, with raising taxes on the rich, which have been cut massively. Uh, 
by I think like six percentage points since uh, 2006 in, in Rhode Island. Um, and we had some language there around uh, divesting from policing and prisons, which we then turned up a bit because right as, <laughs> right as we launched our budget campaign, uh, the uh, Black Lives Matter reemerged as a mass movement in this country, um, which uh, some of my uh, comrades in Reclaim uh, wrote an essay about that in, in this, uh, that journal, The Forge, that Center for uh, Popular Democracy has. It was, a, it was a challenge. It was both this amazing opportunity to have a mass movement explode right as you're launching your organization, also a bit of a challenge when you had all these plans about this is what you're going to do, and then everyone else is talking about something that's not quite exactly what you were planning on talking about. But that's politics and reality. And overall, it was a blessing because this year has been, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, I've never seen so many people interested in, in, in joining a, a new organization with no background in politics before we have people who canvassed for Bernie with us that are, who have no prior political experience who are now uh, leaders, um, like consequential leaders within the organization. Um, so we have the issue campaign um, prong, and then the other, uh, the second prong is electoral. Um, we dipped our toe into the September Democratic state legislative primaries. We endorsed uh, four people, um, two of whom um, were, were DSA uh, candidates, uh, David Morales uh, for state rep, uh, Sam Bell, an incumbent who was being targeted by leadership for the state Senate. Um, and then we endorsed two people who were more WFP candidates, um, Megan Coleman, uh, state Senate, and uh, Leonella Felix for state rep. And that uh, is sort of, uh, representative of, of of the sort of organization that Reclaim is, which is that it's uh, it's run, um, I can say pretty confidently that our whole steering committee is socialist um, majority DSA members, but we are, the, the reason we didn't just attempt to fold the entirety of the RI for Bernie campaign into DSA is because we frankly didn't think that was possible. Um, um, some people might disagree, um, but in Rhode Island, um, and, and so trying to trying to continue that broader kind of left populist tent that that Bernie the Bernie campaign created. Um, and since then, uh, we've had a, we've had good relationships with a number of organizations. I would say we have an extremely close strategic relationship with with Providence DSA um, and uh, and work more closely and in kind of like a special way with them. Um, and then the, the, the third prong, which is sort of the basis of the whole thing that ties everything together, is uh, base building. We're organizing district organizing committees um, statewide. The, initial, the, the idea was to organize a committee in every single one of the 75 state legislative districts. Um, provisionally, we're kind of chopping off some more, consolidating some of the places where we're thinner on the ground into, into, into broader, into larger units than that. Um, and we have about I'd say like a dozen now. So we have a long way to go, but um, uh, we have, uh, but we're making pretty fast progress. We won all of our primary races. Um, we have our, we have a big budget protest on Saturday, which has, uh, uh, we've already done a lot to shape to the debate around the budget and austerity and really put taxing the rich at the center of the debate. Um, the budget's gonna have a bunch of new, uh, a bunch of activists but from a lot of different groups um, new, new and old electeds, and uh, it is a uh, with COVID's resurgence, it is it is challenging to organize a protest right now. And I will be out there two hours before it starts, putting tape on the ground uh, so that people can be distanced as well as masked. I not so much as an actual public health measure. I think mass protest is pretty safe outdoors, but really just to make people feel extra comfortable. Um, so that's what we've been up to. Um, I could say more, but I think I've said enough for now. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for those overviews. It sounds like people are moving really powerful work uh, from Tennessee to Texas to New York to Rhode Island. And I see comrades from all over the country here. I'm sure that there are powerful campaigns uh, happening all across this country that DSA organizers are leading. Um, so some things that I'm reflecting on um, are, you know, when Michael Antonio was talking about the lack of uh, action from Democrats leading to a very narrow, a slim uh, loss to the lack of 
local organizing infrastructure, less by the Bernie Sanders campaign that Dan mentioned. I feel like these factors really point to this vacuum of, of power uh, and the real need to build multiracial alliances of membership organizations to uh, to win things for the working class from rent control to a Green New Deal uh, to, uh, to taxing the rich and more. Um, we know that a lot of coalition partners uh, are usually uh, are often more establishment than DSA, uh, and frankly, are sometimes afraid of the word socialist. Um, I'm curious um, uh, from the four of you um, how you've dealt with uh, that dynamic and that tension of coalition partners who are often um, afraid of the S word. So, any of you can hop in or uh, or respond to each other. How have you how have you dealt with the uh, continuing uh, red scare in our politics, even in 2020. Yeah, I can start on that question if folks don't mind. Um, so for paid sick, it's certainly true that we had big coalition partners. I think one of the um, two of the most important organizations to mention are the Texas Organizing Project, uh, Workers Defense Project, um, both of which, like as we address perennial questions about like the demographics of DSA, like one thing that TOP has figured out is their their membership is majority black and brown and it's older folks, folks that you don't traditionally see in political spaces. And so, you know, it's like, we have a lot to learn from them, even if we disagree philosophically on where our politics should go, just based on the, you know, who we see in, the, in their spaces and willing to have a political conversation. Um, same thing with workers' defense, you know, they organize undocumented construction workers. And so there's just a realness that they bring to the equation that DSAers can learn a lot from. And the paid sick campaign was an opportunity for us to become closer with one another. I think the, the kind of repellent that socialism as a word and as a concept can sometimes be was, was undone in this case by the fact that, you know, it was a big signature total that was needed to be collected. Uh, and there were DSA members ready to go. And so there was a lot more, um, I think, willingness to, to let ideological differences um, be uh, put to the side for the moment of collecting the signatures. And then the actual act of collecting the signatures together diminished the, the tension, right? Um, and I think if you sat down over a beer with one another after a shift of collecting signatures, like you could have the debates but what mattered is whether or not you were gonna show up to collect the signatures the next day. Um, so I, I think it just, some of the, the tensions that we think come from philosophical differences just kind of buckle underneath the organizing. Um, and I think that paid sick was great evidence of that. I mean, frankly, in, 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 in Rhode Island, like some of the issues are just like ordinary, like territoriality and don't have much to do with like Red Scare stuff, though I, you know, um, there are issues even with, uh, is, is this like going to be posted like super widely on the internet? What's the level of, uh, of frankness I could speak with? I think it's not, I think it's on our Facebook uh, page, but. Okay. Uh... I'll just say like even, even even the phrasing of like of, of of tax the rich around this rally like irked some some kind of progressive partners that would you know that who you'd think that we had like put like kind of like all power to like the the soviets on the top of the the flyer rather than just tax the rich which seemed to me like very kind of palatable less populist language that had been somewhat mainstreamed into american political discourse so um you know that said, I mean, kind of, kind of a, the whole, in, so, in some ways, part of the whole idea around Reclaim is that an organization with kind of a left populist identity and approach um, can um, uh, work in certain ways that, that, that DSA confronts obstacles around, which we try to make not be an obstacle for DSA by being in close partnership um, with DSA. Um, but then I would be interested in hearing in New York, like New York, like people might, there might be red scare in New York, but NYCDSA just has so much power, kind of does it. It's, it's fine if people are afraid of them. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, would, I don't, it's hard to tell. Um, I think that, yeah, when you have a little power, 
people will like begrudgingly invite you into their strategy spaces and coalition spaces. Um, and then you get to like build relationships with them and then maybe they'll come around a little bit. Um, I think that, I think, I think that it's difficult. I think part of the work that the universal rent control campaign did was move the entire housing movement in New York state left, um, which is great. Um, and I think the other thing that did that was really building with, with people outside of their own bubbles. Um, so it might not have been explicitly DSA, but it was like, you know, now I say I'm like a rent stabilized tenant in whatever, um, in the Bronx, and then I um, start to build a relationship with someone in Rochester who has absolutely no tenant protections, um, or a homeless New Yorker um, who is like has a, has a different set of priorities and then recognizing the fact that actually like we're fighting together and that your your liberation is tied up in my liberation and all that stuff. Um, it, like it ends up built, like moving people left, um, e even if it's not um, explicit. Um, but I do think that like flexing your electoral muscle generally helps people um, who might not have been palatable to socialism, like at least like begrudgingly accept it. <laughs> For sure. Um, Michael Antonio, do you have any reflections on working with more establishment coalition partners? Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, being in the South, uh, socialism is a spooky word um, in a lot of spaces. And so uh, the way that um, our chapter has kind of been able to maneuver spaces um, is through personal relationships. Um, when I became the uh, field organizer for Shelby County for Mark Peter Bradshaw's campaign, um, I had personal relationships with the uh, Democratic Party uh, chairman and with other people on the Demo uh, Shelby County Democratic Party executive committee. Um, and those relationships help, um, you know, kind of figure out and help me navigate, you know, early voting through the election. Um, and so it, sometimes the uh, work of your hands has to be your gospel um, and you have to bring people to you um, in a way without shouting from the rooftops that I'm a socialist. Um, and so that, that's kind of how we were able to navigate a lot of spaces by like personal relationships and people seeing that our chapter is like doing the work. Um, and that the Democratic Party um, isn't. And so people come to us um, trying to see if like we can get things done. Um, and, that, and that's something that I would suggest um, across the board, like, um, you know, try not to get too caught up on labels because it's about values. Um, and, you know, especially when it comes to coalition building, it's about people who share your values and we can work together on some things and we can work together on a lot of things. And for some folks, we need to know that we can't work with them at all. Um, but, you know, it, we, we can't be, we can't allow purity to preclude us from having an, a meaningful effect on people's material conditions. Could I add? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, just wanted to add one more thing, thinking about it based on the other comments. Sometimes the opposition lines you up too, and that helps from the point of view of a socialist to like make the argument to other organizers who are not socialists that like um, we're still on the same side in the sense that the preemption bills, for example, at the Texas Ledge, um, you know, they wanted to do, do away with the city's power to basically do anything in one of these preemption bills. And it ended up snagging uh, non-discrimination ordinance, ordinances as well. And so all of a sudden in the fold were LGBTQ organizations. And it was because of the zealousness of, of the folks who wrote the preemption bill that, you know, for better or worse, um, 
we were put on the same side by the opposition. And so I think it helps to be able to story tell with folks on your same side, if you can point that fact out. Uh, I think, you know, just an example here locally that the DSA chapter is taking up right now, it's an effort to close a coal plant in the city of San Antonio. And at the same time, there's a fight to repeal certain state codes that give police unions more power than police chiefs to fire officers with terrible records. And San Antonio has some very famous police officers who are um, still on the force who we can't get rid of because of the way the union contract's written. And those two things are gonna share the ballot, closing the coal plant and repealing those codes. So we know the union's gonna pump that municipal election full of money. So it's, it's worthwhile for us to talk unless we both wanna fail. Um, and there's obvious connections between coal and environmental racism and the racism implied by policing. There's anti-democratic aspects of why that coal plant is still being operated and how the police union circumvents process. So there's ways in which the opposition can line you up too that I think is more ground uh, for you to say like, hey, we have the same side even if we have some ideological differences. Um, I was just gonna um, add that, like just speaking generally, like having never done statewide work until this year, one thing that becomes like immediately complex, maybe more for like a bigger 10 organization, like Reclaim, maybe not more, but maybe um, than, than, than DSA is like the like immediate demands of like the inside game and trying to like maintain an outside game and figuring that out. It doesn't seem like there's like actually like a DMV manual for like a, a, a manual for this. And it's more like just a constant thing you have to struggle against and be aware of pitfalls of, um, and like, yeah, yeah. I, and I'm just learning every day and trying to figure out the best way to, to manage, to manage that aspect of the whole thing. Yeah, for sure. That the interplay between the inside game and the outside game is so tough. I think one of the hardest uh, meetings that I have ever facilitated, which includes both the past two DSA conventions, um, uh, was this terrible meeting uh, when uh, when they were settled when the legislature was settling the fight for fifteen and paid family and medical leave in Massachusetts, while also stripping away. Uh, time and a half uh, overtime on Sundays at the same time. And we were getting these inputs from the inside game while we were having the meeting about the outside game. And it was just like the most horrendous thing. <laughs> uh, so it's just, I mean, it is tough. And people are telling you from the inside, you can't say this outside or like- you can't do this. And you're right. like, like, how do I organize knowing yeah. that it's happening and can't say that? It's like crazy making, I don't know. Totally. Uh, totally. Um, and so the last thing that I wanted to ask um, is uh, what's next for uh, your statewide alliance, um, whether it's uh, on it, going on offense on issues, going on defense on issues, is it um, electoral campaigns next at the municipal or state level? Uh, what's next for all of you? Uh, I can go first on that question. Um, so definitely with the local chapter will be doing that coal plant stuff, but I think statewide coordination between chapters, uh, folks are beginning to look at 2022, um, knowing that one of the uh, sort of glaring omissions from like the um, multiple pieces about the, the Latinx vote and the mythology around the Latinx vote, it's like, hey, Bernie did extremely well in Texas. And there's a ton of state reps that like have not been targeted in districts where Bernie did well. So let's point that difference out and um, try to make those re uh, representatives either adopt better policies through a primary challenge or otherwise. And so I think that there's some exploration of um, looking at the state house and state senate and running candidates, understanding that Bernie did uh, well with those constituencies. And then also, I think there's just the possibility to tell like a city level story and this isn't to the discredit of anybody who lives in rural Texas, because I think rural Texans also deserve paid sick time. But the, the thing with preemption is like, look, your big cities all did this at the same time. 
and then your state legislature wasn't able to prevent it with a preemption process. They had to do it through the courts. They had to do it through like a, a minoritarian institution, the state legislature is that too because of gerrymandering. And so you've got cities with millions of people and millions of workers. It's like where the most diverse swaths of Texas are at. So I think there's like a story to be told about like lack of a mandate on the part of state government, as well as like the fact that there's city level politicians and city level organizations who want more, but have an institutional tie up um, given the state design. And so I think, you know, there, there's possibilities for us to tell a better story about how Texas is so poorly designed to actually be democratic, which is true of like so many places, but it's really, really bad in Texas. Um, I can go next. Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a crisis. It's awful. Um, the housing movement is going to be focusing on trying to cancel rent um, and and evictions. And the thing that I think is really exciting that's sort of a continuation um, of a lot of stuff that we've been talking about right now um, is, you know, in order to cancel rent, in order to do everything, we're going to have to tax the rich. Um, and DSA has been, a New York City DSA has been part of like a really exciting push to um, bring together coalitions within coalitions, um, educate the Education Coalition in New York State, the Immigration Coalition, um, the Housing Coalition, and all of these different groups um, and have this like huge multi-issue campaign to tax the rich and raise $50 billion um, for the New York State budget. Um, and so New York City DSA just launched today um, its campaign to tax the rich, which is really good. <laughs> um, but I think it's really exciting. And one of the cool things about it is that um, we've managed to get our platform to be the platform of the coalition, um, which is really cool. So we have some really cool taxes um, coming up and like DSA has been able to play a really important role in the policy um, discussions, as well as the like politics and the organizing part. Um, so it's very ambitious, um, very exciting, um, but it's sort of a continuation of that, of like really working with coalitions um, and a lot of different people. It's definitely been a struggle. It's gonna continue to be, um, but it's cool. So awesome, I was so glad to I was so excited when I saw that email today. I was like, finally, there is like a group that is meeting the, the moment with the demands that we actually need. That's awesome. Um, what's, what's next for you, Michael Antonio? Um, well, here in Tennessee, we're kind of looking at a couple of things. There are things that um, our chapter and other chapters um, across the state are working with behind the scenes as far as um, internal stuff with the Tennessee Democratic Party. Um, we've got our eye on the horizon um, when it comes to the DA's race, because our DA's, um, they have eight year terms. Um, and so ours is pretty terrible. Like she has a, a horrible record that any lawyer with her record would have been disbarred by now. Um, and so we're trying to figure out how uh, our chapter can be effective um, and make a meaningful uh, gains as far as like framing what we need in a DA um, here. Uh, there are also things that we're working on on a municipal level that could fundamentally change how politics happens in Memphis. Um, and those are, you know, ongoing conversations where, you know, we're trying to be sneaky and not let them see us coming. Um, and so we are uh, working on a couple of things on multiple levels to kind of build power, um, not just for uh, folks in Memphis, but across the state and working with our, our sister chapters across the state to, you know, do something to, you know, put some fire under the Democratic Party and um, kind of shake ourselves loose of the supermajority that the Republican Party has on the state. Um, yeah, so briefly, uh, you know, our, this year's, this fiscal year's budget was supposed to be passed in, I think, June, but it's been kicked off because of, uh, I guess, like a misplaced, but maybe understandable hope that, uh, 
Congress would kick more money down to the states, which uh, may have been a misjudgment of Mitch McConnell's moral compass uh, <laughs> or something. Uh, but now it looks like they're gonna pass some kind of provisional budget of some sort for this fiscal year before the end of the calendar year, which is why we're ramping up with the protests. And um, then we're gonna, like, I don't know if, I don't know if we'll win in the sense of like zero austerity in the budget, but I'm confident, but I'm, I'm I am confident that that some sort of tax hike on the 1% will be part of it, I hope. I mean, it's definitely at the center of the discussion. I haven't done, an, we haven't done enough vote counting to really understand where things are heading. But then next year, we'll probably stick with it. We might, you know, be able to uh, work more with, with Sunrise and DSA around, around making the Green New Deal part of our, our budget campaign. Um, assuming that we can try to move from defense to offense for the next fiscal year budget. And then on the electoral front, um, you know, I, I think it's highly likely we endorse whoever DSA puts up. I think it's also likely that we um, run some candidates from our own ranks, including at least one that I can think of who is mutually from DSA and reclaims ranks um, and uh, do it in a bigger way for 2022. Um, but our biggest goal overall is really creating an organization of organizers and focusing just like laser-like on bringing new people into the organization and teaching them how to organize and putting them into leadership as soon as possible at the biggest scale possible. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to thank I want to thank our panelists so much for uh, for sharing uh, so many gems and so much wisdom about. Uh, state, statewide organizing, coordinating across uh, DSA chapters across the state and more. Our task as, as democratic socialists is so great um, during these times of the pandemic, austerity and more. Uh, it is incumbent on us to fight for tenants rights, taxing the rich, workers rights uh, and more, um, uh, safe, safe schools and more, um, all at the state level. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, and if you are interested uh, in joining the Socialist Majority Caucus, uh, you can check out our shared principles at uh, socialistmajority.com. Uh, uh, we are really interested uh, in building this, uh, this caucus of organizers uh, striving to build power for the multiracial working class. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, let's stay in this fight together uh, to build power at the state level and more. We have a world to win. Thanks everyone for thanks everyone for coming tonight.